Hello. Good morning. Glad you guys are here this morning. Uh, are you ready to get into the word today? Good. All right. Yeah. It's an exciting time. Glad we're all awake. Uh, here we go. So I have the privilege this morning of uh, concluding our series that we've been in over the last four weeks called Devoted, where we've been looking at the early church in the book of Acts, um, the first church that was established uh, as soon as, like right after Jesus rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, uh, the gospel is preached and 3,000 people uh, get saved and join the initial 120 followers of Christ. And then the Bible says that they began to devote themselves to four key things that made up the heart of this church, this community. Um, and so we're an extension of that first early, early church. And in 2022 today, we're called to devote ourselves to the same four things. And so just to recap what those four are, I want to read our theme verse. Uh, it's Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. It says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Isn't that amazing? That's our kind of theme verse for this series, our, our jumping off point. And so in week one, uh, we covered the apostles' teaching. In week two, we covered fellowship. Last week, Pastor Nanny talked about the breaking of bread, uh, communion, but then also eating meals together uh, as an act of worship. And then today, we're finishing it off, and we are talking about prayer. The early church was a church that devoted themselves to prayer. Uh, it wasn't just this thing that they, you know, kind of fit into their, their busy schedules. It wasn't a casual thing that they just did every so often. The Bible says that they were devoted to it. And again, the call is the same for us. And so if that's true, we're called to devote ourselves to prayer. I thought it would be a good um, opportunity to start just by asking the question, what is prayer? Maybe you're not familiar. And so let's do that. Um, it's, it's actually interesting. So some translations of Acts chapter 2, verse 42 actually say the prayers uh, plural, while other translations like the one we just read say to prayer. Um, and just kind of as a set side note, there's debate in the church as to what's meant by the prayers. Some would say that it's um, referring to more of like a liturgical kind of uh, set recited prayers that the church um, prayed, while others hold to a more charismatic viewpoint, um, as do we here at Parkwood. It's interesting. Acts 2.43 says, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. God was moving as a result of the church praying together. Um, so just a little side note there. In the original Greek, uh, the word used for prayer in this text that we just read, and then several others throughout the New Testament, is this. And I want you to say it with me. We're going to learn some Greek today, okay? All right. It's prosuchaeus. Go ahead. Prosuchaeus. Bam. Just throw that in your back pocket in case you ever need to pull out some Greek. It's probably never going to happen, but there you go. That's for free. Um, Prosuchaeus just really translates best back to prayer addressed to God. So simply put, prayer is communication with God. We believe um, that like when Jesus died on the cross, he rose from the dead... Um, the veil was torn, and we actually have access to God himself. And so we believe that we can talk to God, and he hears us, and he also can speak to us back, and we can, can hear him. It's amazing. And in Scripture, there's like prayer. There's all sorts of different kind of types of prayer in, in different instances, but we want to stay focused on the, the, the context today. What's most important for us this morning out of this text is that they were praying together, okay? And so here's the thing. Prayer can and should be done 
um, privately in our own personal walks with the Lord. Um, we should have an active, healthy um, kind of prayer life of us just privately communicating with God. The best example of this in Scripture is Jesus himself, who got away from the crowds often to be alone with the Father. That's super important. But in the context of the theme verse, we're talking about corporate prayer, praying together with other believers. This is what we're called to devote ourselves to. So what I want to do this morning really is just jump around kind of in the book of Acts, and I want to show you a couple different examples of this devotion to prayer actually taking place in the life of the church. I want us to kind of get a feel for the rhythm of this uh, in the, the, the community of the church. And then I want to end by just, um, just talking about one point, one thing that God has put on my heart that I want to leave you with today. And then just to prepare you, at the end of our gathering, I've had it on my heart and just feel it's, it's only natural for us to respond uh, to a message like this by actually practicing it. And so what I'm going to invite us to do at the end of the gathering, and I'm going to give some direction, is to actually, I want us to kind of get in groups and to have times of corporate prayer together. And that might be different. It's definitely different than what we're used to doing here. And so I want to just say something real quick. If you're uncomfortable with that in any way, there's a reason why I want to let you know now. I just want you to know nobody's going to force you to take part in that time, and I'll give instruction at the end, but we just want to prepare you in advance and let you know, like maybe you're here and you're just like, I, I don't even know Jesus. I'm still just trying to figure out if you're all a bunch of weirdos. Because, uh, yeah, <laughs> and that's okay. If that's what you think, all good. I'm just glad you're here. Um, so no one's going to force you to do it. You can just stay in your seat when the time comes. It's all good. This is a safe place, but we are going to do it at the end. All right, you ready to look at the book of Acts? Okay, let's do it. So first church is established, right? And they devote themselves to prayer. Here's an example of that taking place. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter 4. Uh, it will be on the screen. Uh, and we're just going to kind of fly through these examples. Uh, verse 23 to 31 of Acts chapter 4. We're not going to read all of that. I do just want to kind of set it up and let you know what's taking place here in the context. So Peter and John in this passage right here have just been put in prison for preaching Jesus, and um, they're, they're kind of being, they're being questioned by the high priests, the teachers of the law, who basically go to these guys and they're like, so you're preaching Jesus, um, by what authority are you allowed to do this? Like, who gives you the right to come up in here and to preach Jesus? And, and so the Bible says that in response, Peter, filled by the Holy Spirit, just kind of stands up and goes on this big, like, speech, and is just like, man, my authority comes from the Lord. Um, salvation is found in, in him and him alone. That's where we get our authority. And so basically kind of preaches the gospel. And the teachers of the law are kind of surprised and, like, shocked. And the thing is, though, they can't find any fault in these guys. And so they basically say this. They say, okay, we're going to release you. But don't preach Jesus anymore, or bad things will happen. Okay? That's a paraphrase, but that's essentially what they're saying. So then this text says that Peter and John go back to the church to tell them what just took place. Right? So they go back to the church, and they're like, it was crazy. Like, we, we were arrested, and then we were on trial, and they said this, and then we said this back to them. And then they said, you can't preach Jesus anymore, um, or bad things will happen. And we're just like, well, we're probably just going to do it anyway. And they report all of this to the church, and check this out. In Acts chapter 4, verse 24, it says this, and when they heard it, when the church heard what they said, they lifted their voices together to God. The church didn't, uh, maybe they did panic, I don't know, but the Bible doesn't go out of its way to point that out. Uh, the church in this moment didn't panic. They didn't, you know, run around screaming, like, what are we going to do? They weren't hopeless, the first thing they did is they prayed together. They went right to God with this. That's what it looks like to be devoted to prayer. And you can read verses 25 to 28 on your own. I want you to actually skip down uh, to verses 29 to 31. Uh, this is what the church prays. They say, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of of your holy servant Jesus. 
And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So the church gathers, they pray together for courage and boldness to face persecution, and God gives it to them. Amazing example. Acts chapter 12 is another one. Go there with me. Uh, And again, the point of this is really not to go super, super deep. And so you could jot these down, check them out in your own devotional life this week. That would be awesome. Verses 1 to 17. Uh, You can jot that down. 12, Acts 12, verse 1 to 17. Here, uh, James, the brother of John, has just been killed. And Peter finds himself in prison again. Acts chapter 12, verse 5 says this. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. And so the church prayed together. And then if you read that whole passage, what, ha- what we see happen in the following verses is Peter's rescued. This amazing thing happens where an angel appears to him and the chains fall off and he is delivered. And so good reminder for us today here in 2022, just like the early church gathered to pray for deliverance and suffering, and the context here is uh, physical prison, but in principle, we, we can gather to pray for the afflicted in the family of God, uh, to deliver them according to his will. There is, there's power in corporate prayer. They displayed their faith, their belief that God would do something, that he would, he would move. And so that's a great example right there. I love it. Acts chapter 13, verse 1 to 3 is another one. Here's what Uh, This says, it says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, uh, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And so an amazing example, here we see believers praying together for wisdom um, in ministry, a um, little bit of mission going on here, commissioning fellow believers, asking the Holy Spirit, like, God, where, where do you want us to go? Who do you want us to send? This was a communal prayer time where they sought the Lord together for wisdom and direction. And I want to pause here for just a moment and point something out. Uh, in the church, when it comes to prayer, Um, we, I think we do, like, we love the part of prayer where we get to bring our requests to God, and we, we get to, we get to talk to him, and we're invited to do that. We are encouraged, clearly, to bring our requests to God, um, knowing that he'll hear us. Uh, For some, there's probably a bit of a, maybe an incorrect understanding when it comes to prayer. There's maybe this idea of, if I ask God for what I want, he's going to give it to me. But even if we have our understanding of prayer correct, we love this part of talking to God. Can I remind you today that prayer is done in the context of a relationship, and in any healthy relationship, one person can't do all the talking, right? One person can't do all the talking. Um, Some of us love to talk. Some of us talk a lot. I'll keep going. Some of us <laughs> probably talk way too much, <laughs> right? And all the husbands are looking at their wives. All the wives are looking at their husbands. They're like, mm-hmm, yeah. It's, it's true. But part of prayer is listening. Like just like not talking and just waiting on God and hearing from him. This passage illustrates that very well. Verses 2 to 3 of Acts 13. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So the Bible says the Holy Spirit said. The church at Antioch couldn't have recorded what the Holy Spirit said if they were talking the whole time. (laughs) Right? They took time to listen and to wait and to hear from the Lord. When is the last time that we gathered together with other believers and after praying and talking and bringing our requests to God, we just sat around quietly and waited for him to speak? That is also an aspect of prayer, and I, I, don't, I definitely don't do a good job of remembering that. Prayer also means listening. 
Our last example is this. It's in Acts chapter 20, verse 36 to 38. Uh, And just to set that up, in Acts chapter 20, um, Apostle Paul has called together the elders of the church uh, of Ephesus. And when he gets them all together, he kind of gives like a, kind of like a speech. This is like the last time that he's going to talk to these guys. And he, he basically just says to them like, hey, you guys have seen my ministry in life. You've seen the testimony of my life. I've been faithful to the Lord. Um, I've never shied away from, from preaching the gospel. Um, and then he, he tells them, he says, I'm feeling called by the Holy Spirit uh, right now to go to Jerusalem to preach Jesus some more. Um, And he says, I'm not sure what's going to happen to me. Here's what I know. I know that I'm going to face imprisonment and persecution. Those two things are waiting for me 100%. But I'm going to go anyway because my life is of zero value unless I do what God has called me to do. And so he literally says, this is goodbye. None of you are going to see me again. And then he encourages them. He's, you know, stay faithful Uh, Watch out for the wolves in sheep's clothing. Let's finish the race well. Kind of encourages them. And then after he does, Acts chapter 20, verse 36 to 38. Check this out. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And then they accompanied him to the ship. And so we don't exactly know the, the specifics of what they prayed about, but there was crying. Well, there was this sad moment, but this really cool kind of moment of just shared grief among the family where they were supporting one another. They were together. Paul, the very last thing that he does with the elders of the church at Ephesus is he kneels down and he prays with them. It's the very last thing that he does that they were going to remember. The last thing that Paul did was prayed with us. Are you beginning to get the importance of this type of devotion this morning? And so we know what prayer is. We kind of see it in the, the life of the early church, those examples, which then leads me into the question for today. And, and the passages have kind of explained it, but the underlying reason, why should we pray? Here we are today, right here, right now. What's the underlying reason? The the, the big reason, why should we pray? And here's the thing. In many of the examples that we just read, we see a pattern or an equation that goes something like this. Church gathers corporately, plus church asks God for something equals God gives them what they ask for. And it is 100% true this morning, Parkwood, that we need to be a church who prays because God is moved by the prayers of his people. He is moved by the prayers of his people. Clearly, there's scripture that backs the thought up of if you want something from God, like just ask, right? He he welcomes us to do that. And of course, we ask according to his will, but absolutely, we need to be praying for God to provide and to heal and to move um, all of those things. And he will. But that's not the main point of prayer. That's not how prayer always works all the time. You know this because you've prayed for something in your life and God didn't give you what you want. For sure there's people in the room that are like, yeah, that's been my experience. Here's the point that I want to land on today. The point point of prayer is not to get things from God. This is what I want you to know. The point of prayer, the point of corporate prayer is we get God. Did you catch that? Pastor Danny talked about the same thing week one when it comes to diving into scripture. The whole point is we get him. We get God. We need to be a church that prays together, and we are. We're going to talk about some examples in just a moment, but it's really easy for us to look at these examples in Acts and to miss the point of prayer entirely, corporately. And again, in saying that, God can and absolutely will move in amazing ways when we call on him. He is doing it all the time. But hear me, and the early church understood this, prayer is about our dependence on God regardless of his response. Prayer is about our dependence on God regardless of his response. Response, the early church devoted themselves to prayer because they needed God. They wanted 
God. They were hopeless without him, nothing without him, and the same is true for us. We're nothing with God, and so we include him in everything, and we call on him. When we pray together, we get God. That's the point. And honestly, I think like for believers who have been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, if that is not enough of a reason for us to vote ourselves to praying together, we need to check ourselves. Check this out in Luke 11, verse 9 to 13. Jesus himself is actually teaching on prayer. This is the passage of scripture where Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer. He says, here's how you should pray, and gives us that guide. After he teaches that and gives the Lord prayer, the Lord's Prayer, this is what he says. Verse 9. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? And so we'll pause there. Clearly, we have permission to go to the father and to ask. 100%. And I'm not saying, hey, stop doing that. No, we have 100% permission to do it. But look at how Jesus finishes this passage in verse 13. He says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Did you catch that? Jesus doesn't conclude by saying, how much more will the Father give you what you want? Or give you things? Or give you stuff? He says, no, 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 no. How much more will the Father give you more of himself? That is the point of prayer. That's the joy of praying together corporately, declaring our collective need for God, which actually does two things. It brings us closer to him, but it also builds unity in the body. It brings us closer together. If we go back to our theme verse for just a moment, uh, Acts 2, we'll go to verse 44. It says, all who believed were together and had all things in common. And Pastor Danny covered this already in the series. That doesn't mean that they had everything in common. If you take this room, like look around real quick. Just take a quick little scan of the room. There are hundreds of people in here right now from different walks of life, different dreams, ideas, thoughts, opinions, personalities, you name it. There are a lot of differences in the room right now. And so what the Bible is saying, like it's this amazing picture of when we come together to pray, Despite all of our differences, every single one of us in the room, we're now focused on one thing. Our hearts and our minds are centered and focused on one thing. That thing is a person, and that person is God. And so they had all things in common because they were collectively focused on God. You think of like a a football team, any football fans? No? Oh, man, this is awkward. Great. Awesome. We got two. We got two. Pick a sport. I'm talking about football. Pick a sport. All right? Um, For a football team to be a good team, they don't just, like, get onto the field and yell hut. Because then every single player on the field has their own idea of how they're going to win, how they're going to catch the ball, how this game's going to be played out, whatever. It's just chaos, right? There's a reason why a football team, in order to actually be good and to win, they huddle up before every single play to make sure there's this shared vision, this shared focus. They're on the same page. That's how you win. It's a good analogy. The only reason it maybe has a few holes is because the Detroit Lions have been trying this and huddling up before every single play for years and still haven't figured it out. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And I know they won last week, I know, but, you know, just look at their history. <laughs> I had to throw that in there. It's this, this same idea um, with, with the church. Uh, worship team, you guys can come. We're almost done, I promise. Uh, practically speaking, how do we as a church devote ourselves to prayer, and how can you take part? 
There's got to be some kind of practical application to this because we know it's important. And so I just want to highlight a couple different ways that we're actually living this out here at Parkwood, and we have been for a long time. And you can join in. So here we go. Um, Most obviously, it just happened before I came up here. Pastor Danny led us in a time of corporate prayer. Beautiful picture right there of every single one of us focusing our hearts and minds on God. Amazing. Uh, We have a pre-service prayer team that gathers in a back room before each Sunday service to pray over this gathering right here. Maybe you don't know that. Uh, Anyone's welcome to join in. 9 a.m. every single Sunday in room 109. You can just show up. That's corporate prayer. Uh, Wednesday nights on Facebook, Pastor Gary and Jan uh, facilitate a prayer time. Uh, Parkwood Prayer, right there. They go through different quests, and you can join in online. The power of technology, um, God hears no matter where we are, and so it works. It's amazing on our Parkwood Facebook page. The only time that they don't run that is on the first Wednesday of every month because on the first Wednesday of every month, they host a recharge prayer and worship service that takes place right here in this room. It is a dedicated time for you guys to come, to gather, to worship, and to corporately devote ourselves to prayer. So that's an example. Life groups is a great place as well where believers can pray with other believers That's one of the key aspects of life groups. And if you're interested, you can text life groups to the number on the screen. I believe it's going to be up there. If it's not, that'd be really awkward. (laughs) Those are just a few examples um, for you guys. Um, We pray for a move of God in all seasons and situations. But more than that, we pray for more of him. We get God and unity is fostered as a result. Amen? Awesome. So what I want to do just in in the last couple minutes here is uh, I want to devote a few minutes to praying together. And so I'm going to give some instruction. And then when I say go, we're going to go for it. And if, again, you're you're just like, I'm not too comfortable, that's okay. Okay. So the first thing that I want to mention is this. If you are not comfortable for any reason, you're new, you're just a guest, you're like, I'm not down with that. Um, A couple things. You can stay seated. No problem. You can sit. You can reflect. Uh, Amy and the team are going to be uh, playing up here. They might go into a song. They might not. They're going to feel it out. You can sit and reflect. If you'd feel more comfortable when everybody gets up and we start moving, you can head out into the lobby if you would like. Our cafe is going to be open pretty soon. We just want to make sure it's a, it's a safe space. We're not going to force you to do anything. If someone asks you to be a part of their little prayer group, just decline respectfully. No one's going to judge you. It's all good. So our worship team is going to be led, and uh, they're going to play in the background and feel it out. And when I say go, I would like us to get, just with the people around us, get into groups of like six or something like that. That number is very subjective. If you're like a family of seven, you're like, well, what do we do? <laughs> Just leave, the, leave one of the kids out. Fine. Send them to another group. Pray as a family of seven. It's all. If you want to bring eight people in, it's all good. We don't want them to, to, them to get super large just so it doesn't take forever. But groups of six, five, whatever. Um, nobody gets left out unless they want to be. Okay? And so get to know somebody. And all I want you to do is when you're in your little group is just not, not a, a time to... Uh, share your life story, but one prayer request that you have in a couple words. And then you're going to spend time praying together. Whether in your group that's you, you guys go around in a circle, and if you're not comfortable, you say pass, or one person leads. Even if you forget what the prayer requests are as you're praying, it's okay. God knows what's up. It's all good. What's more important right now is that we're centering our hearts and our minds on God himself together, declaring our need for him. And we're going to build unity together as a result. And I believe that God is going to move. He's going to give us more of himself. Quick housekeeping uh, thing here. It's just the only people that need to hear you in this moment are the people in your immediate circle. So just try to be respectful uh, of the groups that are praying. Luke eleven thirteen 13, Parkwood. And how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? 
And so we're going to call on God. We're going to declare our need for him. And he's going to give us more of himself because he says that he will. You guys with me? All right. So if you guys could all stand up for me, that would be amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. When you're done praying, Pastor Danny is going to come and close the service off. So don't go anywhere. You can talk. You can, again, join in with worship, all of that stuff. Um, we're just going to go for it. And so when I say go, really the only way that I can make this official is if I just count it down. So when I say one, two, three, go, you're just going to find some people, and we're just going to let God move, okay? So one, two, three, go. Let's allow God to move in our midst.